Let's get started. Welcome to The Money Runner. I'm David Nelson. I said at the start that Jeff had an amazing career across a wide range of Silicon Valley companies. In this section, we talk about the transition from eBay to Google. You talked about data talking to each other. Mm. And I think maybe even before Google and eBay, you were dealing with projects like that, working at companies trying to get their data sets to talk to each other because they had this trove of data, but they couldn't do anything with it. Uh, can you, can you tell us about that? How important is that in, in today's world? Yep. Um, I mean, I'll go way back to start. Uh, so I was at uh, University of Illinois in the late 1980s uh, as an undergraduate and was interested then in artificial intelligence. Um, and there was uh, really interesting academic work happening then already around neural nets and expert systems. And um, as I was working on them then, I was very excited about it, but it pretty quickly demonstrated to me then that they were kind of a, 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 an academic novelty because you know, the internet didn't exist yet, the ability to generate data was very limited, there just wasn't enough data and then enough compute to be able to make them more than, than academic novelties. Um, kind of as you go forward uh, through my career, uh, you mentioned uh, eBay earlier, well, Actually, the first step of my Silicon Valley career was a company called At Home Network. And uh, my goal there was, uh, I, I recognized when I was at University of Illinois, I was kind of living in the future uh, because uh, University of Illinois was an early adopter of internet technologies. So when I was at school in the late 1980s, I had email, I had online discussion groups, I had uh, uh, you know, collaborative uh, development and coding projects uh, with, my, um, with my classmates. And then I graduated um, and was thrown out into the real world and lost all of those things. I like, where, where's my email? Where's my, where's my chat group? Where's my, uh, and this was the early 90s before the commercial consumer internet was really accessible. Uh, so my first step in Silicon Valley was with a company called At Home Network which was building out broadband networking, uh, specifically over the cable television infrastructure. So uh, if you today get um, uh, internet over your cable television provider, whether that's Comcast, Xfinity, uh, Charter, um, uh, Cox, Comcast, et cetera, uh, there's a chance, scarily enough, that some of my provisioning code is still running there in the guts of the system. Uh, to get your, uh, your I said your, at the top of this that if you've been on the internet, somehow you <laughs> you touch their their lives. Yeah, there's a good chance, multiple levels. Let's uh, let's shift gears here, and we have to talk about Google. You know, you were there when it was private. Am I right? Correct. So I was not there at the kind of garage stage. Um, I started in 2003 uh, when Google was still private. I was roughly employee number a thousand or so when I started. Employee number 1,000, wow. Uh, one of the things that struck me in some of the interviews that you did, uh, I think you were, were you coming from eBay at that point? Yes. So you're coming from eBay, you, you had a pretty large team there, you had a pretty big title, uh, obviously very prestigious. You said Google was a little different. You know, you talked about leadership uh, and you kind of had to earn it uh, over there. Tell us about that. Sure. Uh, so as you mentioned, I was coming from, from eBay after being at At Home Network. I was at At Home for six years, uh, kind of 2006 to, to 2001, or sorry, 1996 to 2001, 2-ish. Um, and then went to eBay and I was inspired by eBay where uh, it was really leveling the playing field so that uh, little guys, uh, small merchants, could compete on, a, on an equi equivalent basis with large merchants. Um, and I was very inspired by Pierre Omidyar and, and the vision that he had for eBay. At eBay, I helped build out the, the underlying API platform that further uh, kind of expanded, speaking of the, the, the kind of making data talk to each other, uh, really extended the eBay platform out so that everyone had access to it and access at scale. Um, 
Then though the move, and, and I had a fancy title and large team uh, when I was there. But one of my realizations at eBay is uh, it, was, it was in a transition window where it had moved from the original founder, Pierre Omidyar, to being more, quote, professional management. Um, and in my view, they lost something in that transition. Um, I was a big believer in innovation and innovation through technology. And uh, eBay in that window was at a period where they were focused much more on kind of marketing and expanding share and um, had a view that, you know, it was small incremental changes instead of kind of step function uh, big gains. So that led me to uh, consider other opportunities and, and Google was the one that stood out. From the very first discussions at Google, you know, things that would take weeks or months at eBay were kind of a five minute discussion uh, at Google because there was so much better uh, or so much more understanding and appreciation of the power and leverage that you could get through innovation with technology. Um, so from the, uh, I decided that I wanted to be at Google and then it was a question of, okay, what's, what's the right role, what's the right opportunity? Uh, and that's where I, I gained a much greater understanding of Google and Google's culture, uh, which is Google is a very kind of bottom up culture and very meritocratic. And as I was talking to my- Could you explain flat uh, and, and what it means to a layman like myself? Ah. Uh, so it was uh, uh, organizationally flat, very little management. Um, so my boss at the time, part of the reason that, uh, which was a, a guy named Wayne Rosing, who was the former CTO of Sun Microsystems, was kind of the senior engineering uh, leader at, at Google then. Uh, at the time, he had an organization of roughly 300 engineers that were all reporting directly to him. So part of his <laughs> motivation for hiring uh, me and, and, and some of my colleagues uh, was to get to a slightly more rational structure. So you were um, gonna take some of the load off him? So I was gonna take some of the load off, uh, but one of the things that he encouraged on coming in was, uh, was, was saying to me of Jeff, you know, if you come in with a fancy title, uh, with the culture, there's risk of, of essentially organ rejection. So a much better path for you is you should come in as an individual contributor uh, without a fancy title. And clearly I expect you to, to, to progress uh, and have a you know, broader impact here, but come in as an individual contributor, just dive into issues and, and problems, kind of demonstrate yourself. And I am highly confident that people will, will flock to you and want you and ask you to lead them as opposed to if I declare it up front, then people will view you with skepticism and you risk uh, organ rejection. <laughs> you sound like the TV show Undercover Boss. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. So I, uh, it was a big leap, but I, I put my faith and confidence in Wayne, uh, in his wisdom, and uh, did exactly that. So went from a fancy title and 100 something person team at eBay uh, to being an individual contributor and no title at Google. And then within kind of three months or so, it uh, panned out exactly as he predicted. You worked on some of the more profitable areas of, uh, of Google, uh, Google Ads, Google, Google Apps, Maps. Uh, I took this off of an interview. Uh, you said that it was unseemly to make money. That was kind of the culture <laughs> there. Uh, that's hard to believe for a company, the, the, the size and scope of, of Alphabet. Yes. Um, at the period I started, again, this was before Google being public, um, and again, back to Google culture, and there's, there's uh, a, an enormous number of amazing, wonderful things about Google culture, but one of the quirks was that uh, making money was, was viewed as a little bit unseemly. Um, it was a very academic place. And I think in a lot of respects, my hiring was a bit of, a, of an experiment, because I was the first of what ultimately became kind of my set of peers that became vice presidents and senior vice presidents of Google. Um, I was the first person that was hired that didn't have a PhD as a background. Um, I had an undergraduate degree in computer engineering. Um, and also, uh, I had worked at eBay previously, so was used to the concept of a marketplace and, and making money uh, being kind of interesting and not necessarily unseemly. And, that said, I recognize the importance, given the discussion we had about culture earlier, of being able to translate that into 
things that would resonate for, for Google and Google engineers and Google culture. So specifically, instead of putting a focus on, okay, Google should make money and should make a lot of money, I looked at, when I landed there, kind of the challenges ahead, and I saw um, three really significant engineering challenges that hadn't ever been confronted before. Uh, first was that Google was uh, the largest real-time auction system that was um, kind of rivaling already then the, the transaction volumes on NASDAQ and was already at that point ahead of the, the auction system at eBay where it had been previously. Um, second thing is Google made money roughly 24 cents at a time. That was the average then of the each click. Of, of each click. Um, or each search query translated into clicks. So Google made money 24 cents at a time, so it was also the world's largest micropayment transaction system, uh, which was something that was, you know, there was a lot of interest in, but nobody had, had uh, built and enabled previously. And then the other thing, as we dug in a bit more, was uh, it was clear that there was potential to align user interests and advertiser interests by focusing on quality and to do that, you needed a, a uh, click-through rate prediction system uh, as part of the ads quality system, um, which ended up being the, you know, the most interesting machine learning and certainly now has demonstrated itself as the most valuable uh, machine learning system ever built. So it was by focusing on those kind of engineering and technical challenges that translated Google's ad system into terms that was interesting and exciting uh, in Google culture. This is where Jeff and I part company when we talk about the culture at Alphabet. You mentioned culture here, so let's talk about it. Um, where do you come out on the role of big tech, a company like Alphabet uh, and others, you know, in terms of the regulation of society or maybe pushing society in a, in a certain direction? Is it overhyped? Uh, does it happen? And should it happen? Um, so, back to our, our discussion on regulation, I think government does play an important role. Um, I think in many respects, if you look at uh, focusing on Google specifically, uh, Google's mission is to organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful. And I think in the scheme of things, Google has done a pretty amazing job of doing that. And uh, their products are uh, primarily uh, accessible for users and, and free to use. Um, I think there's an important role for regulation to pay in, in protecting people and people's privacy. Um, but in the scheme of things, I think that Google has uh, done an admirable job of that. And uh, some of the like, current issues that uh, Google is going through, I think, are, are overreach. Um, the biggest criticism I would have of Google so far is that they've done such a good job of, of executing that there isn't enough competition out there. But every time you, you know, do a, a search, every time you decide which email product to use, there are other products out there that are available. Um, Google's done a better job, so they have more customers. That doesn't fit the, the classic definition of, of uh, monopoly that I'm familiar with, which is users not having choice or customers not having choice. So along around this time, you're 10 years in and you were looking for a change. Walk us through the, 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 the shift over to Illumina, mm -hmm. life sciences. That's a pretty big shift yep. from where you were. Yeah, so I had been uh, at Google for a decade, kind of 2003 to 2013, and it felt like a decade, 10 years, was a good opportunity or a good milestone to pause a little bit and reflect and, and look back at uh, what I had accomplished in that decade and if I was going to commit to kind of starting another decade at Google. Um, I wanted to make sure that I was both having uh, uh, biggest impact for Google, but I also had self-assessed that I wanted to make sure that I was energized and excited and I was giving it all, my all instead of just kind of turning the crank. And as I uh, reflected on that, um, I looked back at kind of building Google's ad system from 500 million to over 50 billion in annual revenues and, and the early days of Google Apps, now Google Workspace, and building that up uh, to already then it was on the verge of having a billion users. 
uh, in the early days of Google Maps and then running it as a large enterprise as a general manager, as I reflected back the times that I thought I had the biggest impact and uh, for Google, but also I was the most energized and excited were kind of the early days of each of those, of, of building the foundation and building the culture of execution and getting the strategy right and getting the um, kind of the product roadmap right. So as I reflected on starting a, a second decade at Google, I wanted to get back to the early days um, uh, and building at Google. Uh, and the place to do that then was, was Google X, uh, which was the collection of all of the crazy new things like self-driving cars, et cetera. Um, the other side of it is, in terms of area to focus, is I'd also self-assess that um, I'm very energized by learning. So before I started in the ad system, I had no, no background in, in that area or technology and had to learn it, and that was very exhilarating. Or before starting on uh, Google Maps, I had no deep background in the area, but was able to learn it. Um, as I reflected of things on the horizon that I felt that were going to be important, um, uh, I also saw a, uh, uh, particularly the area of life sciences and biotech going through a substantial change. Specifically, there was just this tidal wave of data that was going to be coming from technologies like genome sequencing, where effectively now with genome sequencing, you're digitizing the, the, the underlying uh, technology of life. And that tidal wave of data uh, both was going to be a Google scale problem, but something that could benefit from the kind of technologies I'd spent the prior decade of big data systems and, and machine learning and AI systems developing. Is that when you ended up on the board of Illumina? Was it, yes. So you're uh, still working at Google? Yes, so I'm working at Google. I've made the conscious choice to move to, to Google X, um, ultimately becoming a co-founder of Google's life sciences efforts there. Um, and then serendipity sometimes just happens where <laughs> the universe works in, in strange ways. Um, it literally, kind of within a week of, of declaring that was a direction uh, that I wanted to head, uh, I got a call out of the blue from Illumina, who was the leader in genome sequencing, who was similarly from their vantage point seeing this uh, uh, just massive amount of data being generated. And their interest was um, that ultimately they needed their customers to be able to make sense of it. Uh, to get maximum value from it. So I was uh, um, asked to join the Illumina board to focus on, uh, help them think through their big data strategy. I hope you enjoyed today's interview. And of course, you know what comes next. This is the part where I ask for your support and no, it doesn't cost money. If you like today's podcast, hit subscribe and let us know what you think. Also, don't forget to visit me on Substack where I publish my blog and research. You'll find articles, charts, audio, and video. Thanks for joining. I'm David Nelson.